And welcome to Accessible Design, which everyone do you mean? Uh, I'm going to start right, right off with an example. Um, we, we do a, a lot of work on websites, helping people figure out how to build them the best way, how to make them the most accessible to as many people as possible. And this is kind of an anonymized example of something that we saw uh, about a year, maybe just over a year ago, uh, when we were looking at this interface. And it's kind of a, a pretty straightforward interface that we're seeing kind of a lot. It's in, in vogue right now. And the idea is that it's these four cards that are on the screen. And there's a, a call to action to flip it over. And so you click on flip and you get more details for that, particular, for that particular item. This is a pretty common pattern. And so we were going through this and the team had actually done some, some really good work to make sure that this was accessible. And so they had included all the information in plain text. It was pretty straightforward. Um, and each one of these uh, little bottom right-hand corners that says flip has some text behind it that distinguishes it from all the others. Because these four calls to action for a screen reader user would all say flip, 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 flip. And that's not really going to make uh, as much sense as it could. And we've been told to do that for years, that we want to provide more context for a, a screen reader user. And so we might do that with, uh, with alt text if that's a separate image. We might do it with some hidden text. We might do it with a title attribute. There's lots of different ways to disambiguate each one of those links from one another. And so it worked, it worked reasonably well. What they had done was they put on each bottom right-hand corner, uh, the alt text was, uh, so you see in the top left-hand corner, the, we have the Ibera Sport Coupe car, and then the Romeo 3 Series car, and then the, I can't even say these words, uh, Mylera 305S car, and the Ibera IX9 uh, sedan car. So each one of those, each one of these calls to action for the screen reader was details for Mylera 305S and details for Ibera Sport Coupe, so that each one of those links made more sense. So we're, that makes perfect sense. We're going through that. They had done a, a reasonably good job. <clears throat> and then we started to test with Dragon Naturally Speaking, somebody that uses voice recognition software. And the mantra for somebody that uses voice recognition software, and they're usually using it because they've got some kind of a mobility or dexterity impairment, some kind of a challenge that prevents them from using the mouse uh, or maybe even the keyboard. So they're using voice recognition for this. So their call to action in each case is flip. But what does the link say? The link says details for Ibera Sport Coupe, details for Mylera 305S, details for Ibera 9 Sedan, details for Romeo 3 Series. So the voice recognition software, even though we've made this work better for somebody that's using a screen reader, we've actually made it worse for somebody that uses voice recognition software. And this is the kind of thing that, that I mean when we're talking about which everyone are we actually designing and building for. So the solution in this case is to kind of combine those two things. So for a voice recognition user, they need to, their, their mantra is see it and say it. Right? So they see the call to action flip. So they're going to say click flip. Right? And, and it's a call to action because you can see the design makes it a call to action. It's got a different graphic treatment. It's got a word. It's got the arrow, the word flip with an arrow beside it. That's basically begging for somebody to say, click flip. Now, it's not that it's impossible for that Dragon Naturally Speaking user to, to do this. They have other mechanisms of getting at that content. They could say, uh, click link, right? And it'll bring up a list of all the links in the page, much like a screen reader user has a, a list of links. A voice recognition user can say, click link, and it will put a little arrow beside each one. And so to get to this third one here, Mylera 305S, it might put a number three arrow beside that. So the voice recognition user would say, click link three. So it still works. They can still get at it. But it takes a lot more thought and a lot more time than it really should. If this thing isn't a link, Right? It is, it, it's quite possible that these things aren't links. <clears throat> then the voice recognition user needs to go through an exercise using the mouse grid 
So to click on that, they might say mouse grid and it'll divide the screen up into, into nine chunks with a number in the, in the middle of each and then they'll drill down on that. It might take them four, five or six steps just to be able to click on this. So we, we think about, when we think about accessibility, we need to think kind of beyond what we're used to thinking about. And I, I even wrote this in the, um, in the description for the talk. I, so I'm a developer, and, and I now consider myself to be more of a designer, but I started as a developer. And in my first you know, three or four years as a developer, I thought I was creating accessible designs and, and ex accessible sites. And it turns out, as I look back on it now, what I was really doing was creating things that were screen reader compatible. Right? And there's a huge difference between the two. Ex screen reader compatible and working well, and I don't mean screen reader compatible in that it just works with JAWS or VoiceOver or NVDA. I mean screen reader compatible in that it works with those technologies from a technical perspective, but it's also easy to use. Right? So we want, to, we want to shoot for something more than that. We want to make this stuff uh, as accessible as possible to everybody, regardless of what kind of technology they're using. And we want to go beyond that as well. So that's, that's the kind of things that I, that I mean when I'm talking about this. So this is, this is me. I'm Derek Featherstone. I'm Feather on Twitter if you're, if you're tweeting this stuff. Uh, feel free to email me as well if, you're, if you want to follow up or if you want a copy of these slides right away before anybody else gets them. I don't know if that's possible, but we'll try that. Um, so feel free to email me, feather at simplyaccessible.com. Uh, I work at this little tiny company called Simply Accessible. There's about nine of us, and we focus pretty much entirely on making things accessible and easy to use. And all of these things that I'm going to share with you today are based on that experience. We've been doing this Simply Accessible is fairly new, but between us on the team, we've got you know, well over 100 years of experience doing this. I've been in this, in this field for, for close to 15 years now, uh, and, and this is what we spend our time doing every day. So I really want, want you to ask this question of yourself. When you think about accessibility, we often talk about diversity and inclusion and accessibility. They're kind of all things that go hand in hand. And we say very often that we are designing for everyone when we're building things and designing them to be accessible. But I really want you to ask yourself this question. Which everyone do you mean? I did a, a search and I, I used this image as an example because I, I was looking for some stock photos to put in here and I did a search for diversity and this image comes up and at first blush it actually looks uh, like there's some diversity in here. Um, there's men in here, there's women in here, uh, there are uh, white people in here, there's uh, African Americans in here, there are Asian people in here, there's people with uh, lots of hair, people with no hair. Um, but when you take a look at it, it's not actually that diverse. Uh, but this, this is like one of the first images that comes up for a search for diversity. And I think this is, this is an easy trap to fall into. And this is something that, that I think we do as designers and developers, product managers, company owners, we do this all the time. When we say we're designing for everyone, we usually mean we're designing for everyone that's just like me. That happens a lot. This is a trap that we fall into. What's not well represented in terms of diversity here? Age. Age. Right? This is, there's absolutely, basically everybody in this collage of photos, and there's probably, in fact, if you look closely, you'll even see that, whoops, that this guy is in there twice. He's like right beside himself in the top right corner. Like that, I think that's just an oversight. But they put him, they put him like profile and face on and they called that diversity. Um, there's no age difference represented here. There's no ability difference represented here. All right, there's, there's, there's no, is there nobody there wearing glasses? Let's just assume that maybe there's some people there wearing contacts. <laughs> like, we're gonna go with that. Yeah. And there's, there's nobody here with glasses, um, you know, they, and, and even there's nobody 
that's, that's got any obvious uh, religious belief difference, right? There's nobody here that's wearing a hajib. There's, well, you know, this Asian woman who's on there twice is wearing the same, well, in Canada, I'm from Canada, so we would call that a toque, but I think you call it a beanie down here. Uh, but she's wearing that, but that's, that's it. Like, there's no, there's, there's not diversity here, but it, it was kind of like out there as, yeah, this is a, di a photo representing diversity. So when we talk about this, we, we need to ask this question, right? What do we really mean by diversity? Who are we including and who are we not including? Um, you know, we talk about religion, gender, age, ethnicity, philosophy. There's all kinds of other things that make up what diversity is. And I think we even want to uh, talk about ability and expertise. And so when I'm talking about ability and, and uh, and expertise, I'm even talking about things like um, how experienced are you with, with computers, right? We're all here, we're mostly geeks, right? In, in you know, with, you know, no offense, but we're geeks, right? We are. Uh, do you believe me? You're not? Oh, embrace it. Yeah. Embra like, we're geeks. I, I, you know, when I try to talk to my dad about technology and help him with things, that's really challenging for me uh, because there's things that he just doesn't get because he didn't grow up with this stuff, right? That's, that's just our reality. Uh, so he, you know, my dad's still like a novice computer user and we quite often aim for that middle ground, right? Who is, we're not looking for just power users. We're all pretty much power users. We're not necessarily looking for power users or novice users. We're aiming for somewhere in the middle. There's a huge group of people that we're kind of uh, that we're excluding. I know when we do testing, we, we work with people with disabilities all the time and work on testing sites um, and actually putting them through the paces and not in terms of just the technical side, but also the overall usability side of things. And uh, I can't tell you the number of times where we've worked with an absolutely expert uh, Dragon Naturally Speaking user or an expert, um, yeah, a, an expert screen reader user and they've been able to get through things that somebody that was kind of an intermediate level or a novice user, they just couldn't do, right? And, and we need to make sure that we represent that, not, not just in, uh, in the way that we design, but in the way that we test and the way that we release things to the world. Uh, we have to remember that we're not all power users. Um, you know, the, the number of keystrokes that there are for JAWS or the number of commands that there are for Dragon Naturally Speaking, it, I mean, it, it's, it's huge. But we've worked in lots of cases before uh, where we've been testing right alongside somebody using Dragon Naturally Speaking, for example, and we've had to, in order for them to get through the test, we've actually had to teach them things, right? Teach them how to use the software that they, they don't necessarily know how to use. So we want to keep, keep in mind that we need to represent that in, in everything that we do. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to give you a, a quick a uh, quick rundown of all the people that we talk about, and I made myself promise this. We're, when we're talking about people with disabilities and accessibility, we're generally talking about people that are, that are blind, that have low vision, that have some type of hearing impairment, uh, a mobility or dexterity impairment, and that could be a lot of different things. It could be mobility or dexterity, it could be things like fine motor control, just having low strength, um, or maybe only having the use of one hand. My, my grandfather in the mid 80s, uh, had a stroke and he was never able to use his left hand again. So that changed the way that he did everything because he had to, <clears throat> he had to do everything with, with just one hand. Uh, and I, I challenge you to do that someday. Try to just use one hand. Use your computer. You, if you want to do it with, with, uh, you know, with computer type tasks, go for it. Um, but even, even basic things like cutting an apple. How are you gonna do that when you only have one hand, have the use of one hand? It changes your perspective on things. So these are the kinds of things that we're looking at in mobility or dexterity. Uh, we're also talking about a lot of cognitive things and, and I'll be the first to admit that making things accessible for people that are blind or have low vision or have hearing impairments or mobility or dexterity challenges is way easier than, than the cognitive side of things. The cognitive side of things is the least well understood area of, of accessibility in general. Uh, and the, the typical 
issues are usually related to some type of functional difficulty. So we have difficulty with paying attention. So we just had lunch, right? So I know that's what you're experiencing right now. Um, we have memory-related issues. That happens after we're out for a night, like we're going to go out to the Gordon, Gordon Biersch afterwards. Uh, so you will experience some memory-related difficulties later on. Uh, literacy issues, routines and predictability. These are all things that have, have an impact on the cognitive side of things. Their, their impact on web accessibility is actually pretty significant, but we don't really understand these things nearly as well as some of the other things. We also are seeing more people talk about vestibular issues these days. Um, and so vestibular issues tend to be things where there's something with your balance or with your inner ear uh, where you actually, looking at a web page or using a web app or whatever it is, start to experience a whole lot of different uh, feelings or symptoms, as you might call it. Vertigo, nausea. Uh, really severe headaches. Uh, it, it limits the way that you work with the web. So, you know, we've had people working with us before um, testing websites and they've actually had significant issues uh, with things like parallax effects, right? Or creating, um, working on a page where as you scroll down, elements of the page start to move around or they zoom in rapidly or zoom out rapidly. Uh, have you seen the, uh, the presentation tool called Prezi? Right? That, that rapid zoom interface, uh, that, that can actually cause nausea and migraines and, and vertigo type effects with people, and it makes them not want to use the web anymore, right? or those particular, particular sites. So those are some of the things that people are starting to talk about now as well. And, and certainly speech as well. There's a lot more native speech capability being built into browsers and into different platforms. And, and we would never, you remember the old, old days where you would call in to a, a voice recognition system via phone. And you know, for, for help with uh, your, your bill, say billing, right? And so you'd say billing, and they're like, no, we, we can't transfer you to, uh, the, you know, to the administrative department. No, billing. No, I'm sorry, we don't have a department. You, you would never build an interface that relies solely on speech, right? You would always have some kind of a backup for that. And so when we're building web interfaces, we need to do the same kind of thing. Right? If you're building something that is speech powered, how do you build that in such a way that you can't assume that speech will be there? So let's start to think about alternative mechanisms. Now, I went through that. I promised myself, and I've already blown this, so this is not some big reveal. I, prom I told myself that when I was doing this talk that I wasn't gonna talk about screen readers today, but I've already blown that uh, a little bit. I'm gonna try and spend most of the rest of, of this talk talking about things other than screen reader users. I'm going to try and talk mostly about people with low vision, people that have mobility and dexterity impairments, and people with cognitive difficulties. And then go beyond that a little bit. That's my goal. I'm going to try it. I don't think it's going to work, but I'm going to try it anyway. So here's a, a quick, uh, quick overview of three types of relationships that you have in a page. And I'm showing you this because of the words that I just said I wasn't going to say. Uh, screen readers. Um, so we have three types of relationships in a page that exist. So this is a, a typical form. We have three types. We have an explicit relationship, implicit relationships, and content-based relationships. So an explicit relationship is a programmatic relationship. So if you look at this contact form where you're choosing a screen name, you can see right there by the number one, I've got a label for that form field, screen name. That is programmatically tied to the form field. That's what we call an explicit relationship. Right? If you take a look just below that screen name form field, you'll see a whole bunch of extra text, some hints. Your nickname here at Corked, one word, letters and numbers only, no spaces or special characters. Now that, in this version, is not programmatically tied to the field. What it is, though, is visually tied to the field because of its placement. There's an implied relationship there. That's an implicit relationship. And there's also another relationship on the page. If you take a look at the error messages at the top, it says there were errors with the information you entered. Screen name has already been taken. That's not programmatically tied to the field. It's not visually anywhere near the field. But if you take a look at it, there is a connection to that field. And the connection is that the first two words in the error message 
match exactly the form field label. So that's a content-based relationship. People that rely on assistive technology really need the explicit programmatic relationships. People that have low vision rely a lot on these implicit relationships. Right? Everybody relies on the content-based relationships. So the content-based relationships are important to everyone. People that use certain types of assistive technologies have a need for the explicit. People with low vision, not, not just people with low vision, but they rely a lot more on the implicit relationships that we create. They also rely on, on explicit relationships, but we're going to focus a lot on the, on the implied or implicit relationships. So let's take a look at some, some low vision challenges. This is uh, a magnification of the Best Buy website. It's just like the, the website like splash page where you choose language and country and things like that. So you'll see here that the screen is split into two uh, horizontally. So there's two big panes. The one on the top is the magnified view. The one underneath is the uh, native view, so not magnified. And this is fairly typical. Uh, you might see somebody that has low vision. They might zoom in on the entire screen. They might not do this split screen. They might do the split screen vertically instead. They might also do a picture in picture. Right? There's lots of different setups for, for magnification uh, magnification software. This is the software that's built into Windows. So everybody, if you have Windows, you have access to this. If you're using uh, Linux, you have access to magnification. If you're using a Mac, you have access to magnification. It's built in. <clears throat> so I'm just going to let this movie play. You're going to see a few things happen. Uh, you're going to see uh, just kind of moving around the interface, and then we're going to get past this splash page and get into the main sort of the main product page. So I just want you to watch what happens. I'll pause it at a, at a few kind of key moments. So I don't know if you just saw what happened, but it was pretty, it was pretty quick. A very small motion in the unmagnified view. What does that lead to in the magnified view? that everything is magnified, right? The rate at which, at which the screen moves is, is just that much quicker. So one of the things that happens, I don't know how well you can see it, but you lose context very quickly, right? You think you know where you are and something happens and it happens so quickly, you, you don't see what you went past because instead of seeing the entire screen, you're just seeing that small little slice at any given time. I'm going to keep going and I'm going to move over down to the bottom right hand side where there's a little uh, language picker. And I get up to the language picker and it's got a list of about uh, six different languages and countries in it. And as I click the select box, the list opens. As I start to move the list, I can make the, the selection in the list. So there's about six items there. But I selected one that was near the bottom, right? And what happens is it stays perfectly in focus in the field of view in the unmagnified view. But when I was down near the bottom of that list and I made that selection, the magnified view actually jumps. So I was on something near the bottom of the list. Now suddenly I'm back up right where I was. Think about what this means for somebody, you know, we, we create select lists all the time that are three miles long. Well, maybe not three miles. That's, I'm Canadian, that was an exaggeration. Three kilometers long. Um, we get this jumping around and that loss of context and it happens very quickly and very easily. So I get to this main page and I'm going to go up to the main Best Buy navigation and I'm in products. And I don't know if you could see what happens, but when I'm hovering the mouse over products and services on the main screen, you can see that this flyout menu, or the mega menu, is starting to appear. I don't even know that it's there when I'm in the zoomed in version, right? So you, you've got to get this idea in your head that people are only going to see potentially a small portion of the screen at once. What does that mean for something like this where we've got this big visible mega menu that shows up out of nowhere, right? So let's, let's keep going here. Also want you to look at
So I'm going to pause it right here. We've got the products mega menu open. Uh, we're in the computers and tablets section, and I've got the computers and tablets kind of subsection of the mega menu showing. On the bottom screen, the unmagnified view, roughly what percentage of real estate does that menu take up? If you had to put a percentage on it. 25, 30%. Maybe 35, depends on if this wasn't a half screen and it was a full screen, it might be even less, right? So that mega menu is taking up, you know, maybe a quarter of the screen, maybe less, maybe more. But what happens in the magnified view? What real estate is it taking up? Everything, right? One of the problems that we've seen in testing with real people with a mega menu, or even, it doesn't even have to be a mega menu per se, it could be any menuing system. It's again, easy to lose context. Quite often you don't know if you're in a menu or are you in main page content. Right? Those visual clues that this is a menu, that there's a border there, that there's a border there, that there's this computers and tablets highlighted state that shows this is kind of the active thing that we're showing. Um, that we're underneath the product section, all of those other visual cues are gone. So when we're looking at that, that takes up now all the real estate. Again, much easier for somebody to get lost. This is a typical set of challenges for somebody that has low vision. When they're looking at a screen, they get to see a very small portion at once. I'm gonna, I'm gonna pick on Best Buy again just for a minute here, uh, only because I can. This is that same home page. Now, somebody that has low vision, they may have all kinds of different reasons or all kinds of different, uh, I hate saying this word, but conditions uh, that contribute to their low vision. So quite often they'll magnify the screen. One of the other things that happens, I'm not gonna say how often because I don't really know, uh, but this is a full screen of light and each word, so this is just that, that home page, this is a whole screen of white light that is shooting out at the person's eyes. And each letter is a little bit absence of light. So you've got, you're detecting small absences of light in a sea of light. For a lot of people that have low vision, different conditions, that actually strains their eyes and makes it harder to read. So what many people do is they sl switch into high contrast mode where they're white text on a dark background. So here's a typical high contrast theme for uh, windows. So we've now switched from a white background with dark text to a dark background with, in this case, uh, yellowish text. So that's now really high contrast, but I want you to take a look at the screen. Whoops, gosh, that was. This is the screen before, take a look at it again. And I'm gonna to switch to high contrast mode and I want you to tell me what's missing. All those navigation items are gone. The search box is gone. This happens because in high contrast mode on Windows, the user is basically saying, I need to modify this display, or the presentation of this display. CSS background images disappear in high contrast mode in Windows. This has a profound impact on what, you, on what you do. Now if you take a look here, take a look at each section, this, now the user probably is going to have a, a tougher time reading that content, the call to action is still there. Right? What we look at when we're looking in high contrast mode is what's missing. And it's not just you know, I could, in high contrast mode, I could take my mouse and I could put it over the navigation items and they would be there. But I don't know that they're there. I don't need, I don't know to put my mouse over there because there's nothing that's pulling me in saying you need to put your mouse here. So we are always looking for things in, in high contrast mode. Those background images disappear. So what you need to do is, is look for this kind of thing. Review every interface that you create in high contrast mode and look for loss of functionality or meaning. Right? Is the functionality gone? In that case, search box was gone. The navigation was gone. 
Right? You can still get around the page. There's other things that you can do. But that core main navigation, wow. Kind of an important thing, you would think. I would hope, anyway. Don't just look for loss of functionality, but look for meaning as well. Right? Is there any meaning that's lost? Right? We've seen things, I'm going to just back up here for, for one second. Take a look at that search box. We've often seen things like this, where that search box, you can see it's just a, a standard search box-ish, um, but the call to action that makes it a search box to the user is that little magnifying glass that's in the right-hand side of it. We've often seen a, t a text box used with a background image for the magnifying glass. But it's a native text box. So what happens in that case? If this was a native text box with a background image for the search, when you switch into high contrast mode, just the native text box shows and the, the search magnifying glass is gone. So now instead of a call to action that tells the user this is a search field, it now just looks like any regular text field. Right? So not just loss of functionality, but loss of meaning. So look for these things. <clears throat> this is a, a bad, bad interface. Can I, can I come back to you? Okay. This is a bad interface. This is a, a tap, a faucet in the shower from a hotel that I stayed at over in the UK. And I had a, a hot water tap on the left, and I had a hot water tap on the right. And this confused me greatly. And I said, OK, I will not shower today. I, I don't like the sounds of this. This is not going to be good. This is not going to end well for anybody. It didn't make sense until I saw a tile that said the left tap operates the shower and the right tap operates the bath. So now I at least know if I'm going to burn my head or my feet. The problem with this interface is that the tap is down there where you expect it to be. And the tile that has the instructions on it is about six feet away on the side wall. These two things need to be together. This is a, a, a design principle called proximity. These related items need to be together. So let's apply this to uh, a web interface. This is a, a, another example that we found in, in working for a client. And this was coded to be programmatically accessible. So it was programmatically quite solid. Screen reader user wasn't going to have much problem with this because it was done well. However, when you take a look at the design, it was actually a bit of a nightmare for somebody with low vision. Now, I'm going to show you the way that the information is chunked here. We have two sets of questions on the left, and we have two sets of yes, no radio buttons on the right-hand side. So we've got these blocks of content, and we've also got these blocks of buttons, a quit button and then a previous and next button. I'm going to give you a really simple test that you can do. Some of you that have been in some of my talks before, you know exactly where I'm going to go with this. But I want you to take, if you can see the screen, take either your left or your right hand. And I want you to hold it up like you're squeezing a straw. Okay? I want you to do this. And I want you to take a look at the screen and go through the motions of filling out this form while you're looking through the straw. Make the straw as tiny as you can and fill out this form. What would it take to fill out this form? This, I love doing this. I, I, I don't have my camera, but I always take a photo of people doing this. And I'm, and I'm being serious, too. What, go through the motions of filling this out. This is, we call this the straw test. It's a very crude simulation of low vision. It doesn't actually, uh, it doesn't actually simulate anything to do with the reasons for the low vision, but it does give you a simulated, really small field of view, which is what most people with low vision have in some way, shape, or form. So what was the motion that you needed to go through to fill out this form? Left, right, left, right, left, right, left, right. So when we're zoomed in, if I'm using a magnifier, this is what it might look like. You still had the benefit of, if you didn't close your other eye, you still have the benefit of seeing the rest of the screen to know where you are. But if you're zoomed in, this is the kind of scenario, and this is probably at about 1,200%. If you're looking at this, and then you go and you find those answers, what has happened? You've lost that context, right? This happens to people with low vision all the time. So we move over. We've got no sense of what yes, no set of radio buttons goes with which question, right? 
And it's not that you can't find it, but you have to go back and forth and maintain it to figure it out. So we go back and we do the other set of questions. And we go back over to the right-hand side. And now if we've done all four questions, we've gone left, right, left, right, left, right, left, right. Where are you gonna go next? Left. Left. Right to the quit button. <laughs> this is not a great, great place for our primary call to action, especially when we've created this left to right use pattern. Right? And if I go right over to where those yes, no's were, the first thing that I see is that previous button. We've put the next button, and I say we very loosely because I didn't do this, but that next button is in probably the worst possible place it could be in. It's in the last place that someone would ever look. What else did you notice about the buttons? I'm gonna back up one screen here. So they're, they're yeah, they're, they're graphics um, that have um, text on them quit, previous, and next. The only way to tell one button from the others is to read it. They all have something that's called the same visual weight. Right? They've got the same size, they've got the same color, the same shape, the same font size on them, everything. Right? They have the same visual weight. There's nothing that attracts you to one more than the others. Right? Now, if I go through this and jump to the next slide, I'll show you what we did as a kind of a counter proposal. We wanted to deal with this visual weight issue. We also wanted to deal with the, the proximity issue and this massive left to right scrolling that we created. So what we did was we increased the font size on each question. We brought all the yes no's right underneath and we put, and this is like we were just, I literally did this in the browser as we were doing it. So I, I randomly chose a color. This is not the color that I said that the client had to go with or anything like that. Um, but we distinguished the primary call to action, the things that we actually wanted them to do from the things that they could do but weren't really necessarily desirable. So we used layout here to create the right chunks. So we still have four chunks, but instead of being left to right, they're all above, like stacked vertically. Right? As People that create interfaces, we want to keep this kind of thing in mind. This is something that works better for somebody that has low vision because we're eliminating a lot of left to right scrolling. Right? We can now, if I'm zoomed in, it's pretty straightforward. Right? We've got, generally speaking, one direction of motion instead of two. We're, we're making it much easier for a low vision person to be able to use this, generally speaking. I'm going to give you one, one more example on this and then I'll, I'll answer your questions, I promise. I want you to think about this in terms of data visualizations and graphs. Right, we talk, there's a lot of talk right now about making things like this accessible to screen readers. Absolutely, it can totally be done. But I want you to do, use the straw test on this. And I want you to tell me, compare the value of India to the Russian Federation in 2009 for their gross domestic product growth. So India compared to the Russian Federation in 2009 for gross domestic, gross domestic product growth. I see some of you making your straws really big. That's cheating. Keep your straws small. How difficult is that to do? That's difficult, right? How do you know which one is India and which one is the Russian Federation? You have color and you have to go down here to find it and you've got to go back up to find that line. You've got to remind yourself of which color is which. You've got to find them on there. You've got to find 2009. You've got to, how did you find the value for, uh, for India for 2009? You have to go up, find that dot, move all the way over to find the scale. Then you had to go back to 2009, find the value, the dot for the Russian Federation and come back over to the scale. There's lots of ways to alleviate some of these problems, right? The very least of which is repeating this scale on the other side. 
right? We could take that scale and repeat it on the other side. If you take a look at the point that's there, uh, that where I'm hovering, you can see it in India in 2006, it was 9.263. So that's actually a good technique. We've got this little tooltip type mouse over that helps us see the actual values. Right? So we don't have to go and use that scale. Right? I've seen lots of graphs and charts where the individual values for the points aren't actually expressed in a tooltip or anything like that. So we need to keep these things in mind. Uh, what about for somebody that's colorblind? We have to think of other ways of doing this kind of thing, right? And, and this is an, a horrendously ugly example that I'm about to show you. It was more to show that I can, not that I should. Um, but you can add different styles of lines. This is using a, a charting library. And you can, most charting libraries have the ability to say what kind of line do you want to use and what kind of shape do you want to use for the, for the data points. All right, so this was using both. So we've got X's, triangles, circles, and squares. We've got a, a dotted line, a dashed line. You could have a solid line, dot, dot, dash, dot, dash, dot. This sounds more codish, but uh, there's, there's different things that we need to, to keep in mind and that we need to, to keep track of here. So when you're looking at any interface, you can do this at a wireframe level. You can do it at a mock-up level. You can do it on a live site level. Use that straw test, because what you will do with that straw test is uncover layout and design challenges for people with low vision. Right, we simulate that low field of view or that small field of view. You will reveal so much stuff in your, in your work. It will surprise and amaze you. Now, I'm not saying that you can change everything, but there are really obvious things that you will be able to change, like where you put calls to action. Right? We've seen, we see interfaces all the time where there's a save button in the top right hand corner, but we've got a whole set of editing fields that come all the way down the screen and then there's nothing at the bottom field. Right? The save button is way up on the right hand side. So there was a couple of, couple of questions. Uh, you had a question first. Yeah, so the, the back on that Best Buy page where we had that select drop down and it kind of jumped around, there really is no solution for that. Um, it's something that you kind of just have to accept that people are going to lose a bit of that context. And so that, that jumping isn't something that you can really fix. Uh, architect, so it's a little yeah. So you can make sure you provide a search. And you could also make sure when you click on a general topic that the subtopics are included on the page. And so you were talking about the language selector right at the beginning, right? And, and the country selector. So one of the other solutions, and I, and I I guess I made an assumption on what you were looking for in terms of the solution, that you were looking for a technical, like, coding solution. There is no code solution to it, but you could certainly make a lot of design, uh, design changes to it. Um, you could actually set that up so that instead of using a select, uh, you could just use a, a, an actual a flyout menu type thing, not an actual select box, like a form select box. You could craft your own with a little expansion where the jump and the focus wouldn't change. If you have more questions about that, you come and talk to me after and I'll show you what, what I mean. I'm going to talk quickly about some mobility and dexterity challenges as well. Um, this is a, a pretty typical like slider uh, type interface, and we've done a lot of work to make these very screen reader accessible these days. So I'm going to let this uh, play. You can just see how this, how this works. Uh, we're setting some different levels here for, this is how much you spend annually at uh, an auto service shop, and they've got a rewards program, and so as you adjust the sliders to say how much you spend on a particular type of repair in a year, they adjust your annual rewards that you get back from that program. And this is a, a fairly, fairly typical setup for sliders. We can make this programmatically accessible to a screen reader user very easily. Uh, we use a lot of ARIA to do this. We call each one of these things a slider. We add keyboard handling to it. And I'm manipulating all of this using the keyboard right now. Well, not right now, but earlier when I recorded it. Um, this doesn't work well, though, for somebody that uses voice recognition software. These motions and I'll, I'll change it over to this alternative view that we created. And it's, I can use each one of those sliders with voice recognition software if I want to. I can look at it and I can say, uh, click parts. And I can get 
the uh, mouse cursor in about three or four steps, I can get it to be on top of that part slider. And I can then say, mouse drag right, mouse drag left. And it'll go pretty slowly. It'll be going about this, I'm saying this fast, but this doesn't mean anything. Um, I'm moving my hand you know, fairly slowly. And then I would say, I can say faster, faster, faster. And it'll start to go faster. But then I overshoot and I have to say stop. Mouse drag left. And then I go back until I get to that spot. Very difficult to manipulate. It can be done. You can do drag and drop with voice recognition software. But man, it's just a hell of a lot easier to put a text box there. If I put a text box there, instead of me having to fiddle around with a slider with voice recognition software and saying, you know, move faster, slower, whatever it is, I can just say click parts and put the cursor in there and type in the number 73. It is probably something where manipulating it that way with the text boxes probably takes maybe 30 seconds in total, whereas to get those same exact values uh, with the sliders, and again, this is an anonymized uh, pseudo-fictitious example uh, where the numbers really don't matter, but for a lot of things the numbers do matter, what the outcome is. So using drag and drop with voice recognition for coarse level adjustments isn't so bad, but when you're talking about fine level adjustments, much easier to just manipulate those with a, with a text box. So we look at doing something like this where we have multiple ways of sol solving the same problem. Now I want you to use the straw test on this. What's going to happen as you're manipulating that slider? When you're looking and finding a slider to manipulate, what happens? You can't see what you're doing. So we also always try to build in, for somebody that has low vision, something like this. Now it doesn't have to be right on the handle itself or right on the thumb. It could be a value that shows up above like we saw in the graph. But having those things related together is going to make it 100 times easier for somebody that has low vision. That make sense? I'm going to show you this one other example. This is a, a little bit of a frustration and, uh, with, with voice recognition software. Um, I'm going to, oh wait, my volume's not up. I'll explain it to you. You can see what's happening here. I'm going to dictate into the specialty box. And I said the word throat because I'm looking for a throat specialist for, uh, for medical reasons and I told it to click search, and it goes off and it does the search. I'm gonna now manually type it in, and you see this a lot in interfaces, that when I'm typing it in manually, I get like an auto-populated an auto list of choices. Quite often we see people in interfaces assuming that one of these auto-suggested uh, auto items is going to be selected. Uh, you can't make that assumption. This is like progressive enhancement, right? You can't assume that one of those choices is going to happen. With voice recognition software, because of the way the events fire, that box didn't even show up. Right? So we need to have multiple means to achieve the same goal. Right? We need to have multiple methods for doing things. Things like auto-suggests, you should allow for any, um, you know, any random text to be, to be submitted. Don't assume that it's going to be one of the choices from the list box. One, one cognitive example, I'm going to let you think about this. I want you to read uh, this screen, and uh, if you can't see the screen, you might want to get somebody beside you to tell you what the words are. Um, and actually, if you can't see the screen, you have an unfair advantage, which is kind of because you need somebody to read it to you. So give it, uh, give it 10 seconds. I want you to read this. Do these words make sense to any of you? Individually. Individually they do, right? Now, read it out loud as a sentence, like it was a bedtime story, for example. Does it make more sense now? 
uh, switch it over and you'll be like, oh my gosh, I can't believe this is Little Red Riding Hood. On the cognitive side of things, we're only beginning to understand the impact of that on accessibility. Each word can make sense by itself. That doesn't mean that it makes a cohesive whole. Right? And I'm not saying that people read things like that, but think of this two ways. Think of it as somebody that's reading and has a literacy difficulty where each individual word makes sense, but the whole doesn't make sense. Or think of it as somebody that is uh, reading a different language and you're, or you're speaking to them and you sp their native language is different than yours. Right? How well do they understand what you're saying? Right. This, this makes for some real challenges in cognitive, uh, in cognitive disabilities in terms of the content that we create. And the last, last couple of things to think about are what are, the, what are the impacts, we haven't even talked about aging, what are the impacts of aging on what we do uh, with the silver tsunami? What's the impact on culture and what we do in terms of accessibility? We haven't even started to, to explore this at all. Um, and I'll, I'll leave you this. Uh, concept. This is a guy named Edward T. Hall, and he wrote this book in the mid 70s called Beyond Culture. And he studied this. He studied uh, silent, the silent language, all about how people communicate without words. And he created this concept of high and low context cultures. And so, in a high context culture versus a low context culture, it's about the collective versus the individual, group empowerment versus self empowerment, authoritarian style of information delivery versus exploratory. Uh, accuracy is valued over speed, speed is valued over accuracy. Uh, context is implied based on being in that culture, and context is explicit and self contained. And these, this difference between high and low context culture, of course, it is a continuum, but I want you to think about what that potentially means for the way people understand our sites and our apps. I'm going to show you four McDonald's websites. This is the McDonald's website from the US for the filet of fish and this is the Canadian filet of fish This is the uh, South and East uh, Indian, like India, filet of fish and this is the North and East Indian filet of fish. And I love that they're all different. I don't know why the, on the American one, the cheese is on the top and all the other ones, the cheese is on the bottom. I don't know. Um, there's different words that are being used everywhere. And if you take a look uh, on this uh, final one, this is part of what a high context culture means. So India is generally speaking known as a high context culture. North America um, and Western Europe is a very low context culture. What's different about this filet of fish? Looks like it's on a plate. It's on a plate that's on a table. Whereas all these other ones are mysterious UFO filet of fishes <laughs> that are kind of floating everywhere. Now, I don't know if it's because they haven't got around to updating the imagery or if that's done with intention, but man, do I want to know more about this. And I've only just started to, to learn about this and explore this idea of, of what a high context versus a low context culture is and its impact on what we do on the web and, and accessibility. So I want, this is, that's kind of it because I'm totally talking and there's other people waiting to get in here, but I kind of care but don't care because you guys are fun and you're here with me. So. Um, those are the kinds of things that we want to think about when we're talking about inclusion and diversity. Um, and, and this stuff is totally new to me and I love that, uh, that, it's, that it's something that we can explore more. Um, so ask that question, again, which, when you're asking about accessibility and thinking about designing for everyone, ask yourself which everyone do you actually mean? Thank you very much.